Thank you. Okay, now we're on the equation of six, which is the non-dimensional form. Just the minus sign correctly. And so, uh, one of those is the easy case. You're welcome to do the hard case, but I'll sketch out what I think the hard case would look like. So, if, if we set this to zero, then this equation becomes a cubic, but it's homogeneous, so one solution is out equal to zero, but the other solution satisfies a quadratic equation in alpha squared, right? And then if we just solve this equation of alpha squared, we get a q tilde minus one, which is the famous factor that comes out linear theory, but then it's divided by k alpha, which is a positive number, plus c alpha, c sub l alpha in one, which is a positive number, times q, which is also a positive number. So every, I'm saying that the denominator is a positive number, and the numerator is either positive or negative, depending on whether q is greater than or less than one. So what this says is, when q is less than one, the only possible solution is out equal to zero. But above q equals one, there, there are three possible solutions, namely out equal to zero, which proves to be unstable. I say that because of external knowledge, which I haven't yet shared with you. And then the other solutions, there are two solutions, alpha squared equals this, and therefore alpha is plus or minus the square root of this, right? So it's symmetric. <coughs> so, I'll just sketch this over here. So we're going to have now a solution that looks like this. Here's Q tilde. Here's one. And there's one solution up to, this for alpha, there's one solution up to Q tilde equals one. And then there are two solutions, right? It's split. It bifurcates. That's what the map that we can say. It bifurcates into two possible solutions. And either way is possible. We don't know this from what we said so far, but if I'm on this solution and I kick it appropriately, I can go to this solution and vice versa. If I kick it just a little bit, it will oscillate. That's dynamics. We haven't talked about that. I know it will oscillate dynamically and then return to this. But if I kick it big enough, it's just right. I'll kick it over here. By the way, the kicks are subtle in the sense that it is not true if I kick it a little bit, and it comes back to here. Then if I kick it back, kick it a large enough amount, it'll always go over here. Sometimes, if I kick it a large amount, it'll go to here, and I'll oscillate, but eventually turn back to here. Other times, when I kick it enough, and it'll oscillate back and forth, but eventually end up here. It's almost like a roulette wheel. It's almost like flipping a coin. There's a certain, there's, there's a very delicate dependence on how I cite the system as to whether I end up here or here. Okay. I guess, does that really matter? I mean, it's just a reflection, so like... Does it matter physically or mathematically or no? I don't know. Well, if, if I were to do the experiment, think about doing the physical experiment, and one could build an experiment that replicates this uh, good approximation, then I could end up in either case, and this one I could end up on. The probably depend on slight imperfections in the experimental model. If the experimental model is perfectly symmetrical, then you have this. If it's slightly bent one way or the other, then might prefer to go here or here. And by the way, this is this is all now for C M A C identically zero, right? If C M A C is not zero, then it will start out at zero here. Because C and C gets multiplied by Q. But then the you know, solution goes like this. Now, I'm just talking. It depends on C and C is, but it go like this, and then it'll go up like here. And then there's another solution. So this is for C and C not equal to zero. This is another solution for C and C not equal to zero. And again, note that below a certain critical value of Q, there's only one solution, but above that, there's three solutions. But now they're not quite as pretty and symmetrical as before. Also, this solution, which is analogous to this solution when C and A, C was zero, this part of the branch is going to be unstable, or we expect it to be dynamically unstable. Right? 
Now, you might want to ask ourselves, what happens when Q gets really large? Because that's where the aerodynamic nonlinearity actually comes into play. So let's look back to our equation. This is alpha squared as a function of Q. There's a Q here, but there's also a Q over here. Now think what happens when Q gets really large. For example, if K out and T out both of one, you know, as typical values. Then this is one plus Q, and this is Q minus one. So if Q gets really large, this is basically Q over Q, right? Because Q is very large compared to one. So this goes to essentially uh, yeah, it goes to uh, one over this coefficient. If it's one, it's one. Or it's not, it's something else, right? So what this means is, when, you get very, when, I get, when Q gets very large, without the aerodynamic nonlinearity, this goes off the infinity, but just the structural nonlinearity. But with the aerodynamic nonlinearity, because remember the lift is getting smaller and smaller due to the aerodynamic nonlinearity. So as it's getting smaller, eventually this thing just goes to an asteroid. So this value is. 1 over the square root of CL alpha 3, 1, plus and minus, which is the natural coefficient. And that's why I thought you would tell me when you did your homework. And you would have, except I messed up the minus sign. So I hope you'll forgive me this one time. I, I don't promise ever to mess it up again, so I'll try not to do too often. But again, this was an opportunity. Well, you didn't tell me I had made a mistake. You think how much extra credit you would have gotten. I would have been so impressed. But again, maybe you're just too polite. You know. In the future, don't be so polite. Right. Uh, what else do I have to say? What is, what, what is the physical interpretation of 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 from my phone to the phone, I just right. uh, Wind tunnel. Think about wind tunnel model. It could be a air, real airplane. Wind tunnel model. So here's the ceiling of my wind tunnel. Here's the floor. And I can make symmetrical airflow. You have to keep everything symmetrical. My symmetrical airflow is the air. And it's connected to the ceiling. Now I blow air on it. Um, <clears throat> either due to CMAC not being zero, or because this thing isn't exactly symmetrical, so there's a bias, this will rotate to an angle alpha up to a small amount. That's on this press, let's say. But then when I get near the funner Q, when I get near Q tilde equals one, as I normalize Q, then the, the angles will get much larger. Yeah, no. Specifically, does an angle more than each pi or the negative pi, does that mean anything? Well, yeah, if you get that thing, I break my model and my simple half mathematical I break my physical model and my simple mathematical model probably no longer apply either. I mean, this thing will apply up to maybe an algorithm of 20 degrees at most. Okay. Yeah. Beyond that, other things happen. Because when this, when this gets very, if this thing looks out very large, by the way, we've done this experiment too. And other samples small. If this angle gets very large, let me call it like this. Let's say it's 45 degrees. Then you get vortices off the edges. And you would have a piece of turbine machinery called non synchronous vibration. You get NSV. So this, what we've done only holds as long as the angle is. Maybe up to 15, 20 degrees, and then beyond that, our math model doesn't really tell you the right physical story. Okay, let's see. What else do I want to tell you about that? I have some more notes here, and I won't bore you with it. Other than you can take this equation and solve for alpha as a function of q. You could also, and sometimes it's interesting, solve for q as a function of alpha. And this would be easier to actually work out the physics, particularly for the case where you see a matrix is not zero, right? Because um, this equation is always linear in Q, whether CMAC is zero or not, right? 
therefore D is a sum for Q in terms of alpha but vice versa. If C and A and C is not zero, then this is a cubic and alpha you have to go to MATLAB or do something to find the cubic roots, right? The three roots of the cubic roots. So you could do that. And that might be interesting to do numerically. And then I have some notes on what happens when C and A and C is zero and I just make my guess what happens. Now, you shouldn't take my word for it, right? The independent scrolling and checking. So feel free to rerun your code with the minus sign and code to see if you get the sketch that I appreciate. Any questions about that? Uh, I'll call them. If you have a question, now's the time to they have a question. Any questions, Stockholm? We can hear you for a second. <laughs> you can tell them to turn off and then turn on again. Okay.
So in principle, here's what I need to do. Given all these coefficients from aerodynamic theory or GJ comes from a structural theory or whatever, and given delta, I need to solve this equation for alpha. Right? As I've written it, I've left out any nonlinearities, right? There aren't any nonlinearities yet. I can put those in too, but I haven't put them in yet. And therefore, this is a linear equation that relates alpha and delta. Therefore, one thing I do know, I know that alpha will, when I find that solution for alpha, the solution for alpha will be in proportion to delta because it's a linear equation. If I double delta, I'll double alpha. If I can ever find alpha for one delta, and someone says, no, you really have twice that many delta, I said, not a problem, I can multiply that. That's the nice thing about a linear model. Okay. So, I need to find alpha as a function of delta. We need to talk about that. But once I find that, then what I do, I take that alpha and the delta and put it back in equation 6, because that determines the lift, right? And by the way, the lift will depend on Q, but alpha would also depend on Q, right? Because how much I twist depends on how much the dynamic pressure is. So, then well, there will be, if I go through all this analysis, there will be a value of Q which makes the lift exactly zero. Because there's a, a twist that will twist down rather than twisting up, and there will be a balance between these two terms. Just like there was for the simpler models when we had a spring, right? Except now, finding alpha as a function of delta is a little more complicated because I'm dealing with a different equation. Okay. Well, if alpha is proportional to delta, and I put that in here, then the lift is proportional to alpha, a term proportional to alpha, which is a term proportional to delta, right? Plus this other term, which is proportional to delta. So ultimately, the lift will be proportional to delta. So I will find reversal as the coefficient of this relationship says that no matter what delta is, at some value of Q, the lift will be zero. And then I have found the reversal condition, and I'll be done. Okay? Well, I can go through all of that. But gee, I mean, there are other things I want to talk about. So, but I don't want you to miss the experience of doing this, right? But well, what can I do? So, there's a homework problem. That's a great idea. I'm glad you suggested it. It never occurred to me to do that. Well, good. That's pretty helpful thinking. So, as one of our students in the room suggested, I'll sign this as a homework problem. I won't mention that person's name. So I won't get any, no, they won't get any ugly emails from other people. Oh, yeah, okay, after class. Okay. Uh, so the homework problem. Four is five. Number five. And you may want to non-visualize things, right? That's just a, just to make it. And, and you kind of, of course, I'm, I'm a reasonable guy. And even just for the case, special case of GJ, except for all these things are constants. Right? Because if they're not constants, it's going to be more difficult for you to solve that different equation that determines alpha in terms of delta. So if they're constants, you can use the same technique we use for divergence to sort of solving the different equation. Right? Okay. And therefore, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Let's just see him and see not equal to zero. That that will simplify it. Uh, uh, and let's define a lambda. No, no, a lambda. Let's define Q tilde. Uh, this might be a non-dimensional Q, and let's see what we do. Uh, that'll be Q, C, E, over G, J, over L squared. I think that's right. So that's another definition. And, um, You'll need to know E over C, 
And let's make that a number. What number do you want? Let's say 0.1, right? That's, that's a number. Right? Um, and you'll need, uh, what else will you need? You'll need the uh, ECL for D delta. Uh, ratio to DC on the alpha, and let's make that, uh, you know, let's make that point two, just so we won't confuse it with that point one. And then you'll need DC MAC D delta over, uh, over DC LD alpha. And I think you'll discover that if you're going to get a positive Q, this is going to be a negative number, which means that the moment due to, if I, if I have my control surface, and again, I'm sorry about that, uh, if I have my, if I have my wing and I have my control surface, this is delta, right? So if I wrote this, this down, that's going to create a moment this way, so the moment's going to be nose down, right? And therefore, since my sign convention is the moment the positive goes up, that means this number is going to be a negative number. Well, well, wait a minute. Let's say it makes that minus. I hope I got the minus sign right. If I didn't, this is your chance to correct me and be a hero and get extra credit, right? But let's, let's make it this is point one also. Is that okay? Is that error or three? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. I did not mean to leave that off. Thank you. So that's DC Mac over D Delta? Huh? Okay. Over, over D Alpha, right? Yeah, yeah. that's the term. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't like that very clearly. Sorry. I think that's all you need. What equation are you if, if you don't, if you don't, if you need something else as you do the solution, let me know. I think I gave you everything you need. Sorry, what equation are you looking at? That's all we need. What equation are you going to solve? I'm going to solve equation eight. Yeah, this is a different equation. But all these coefficients are constant, right? And I, I'm suggesting that you non-dimensionalize Q, and you non-dimensionalize Q by non-dimensionalizing Y. Y, we're also going to non-dimensionalize. Y tilde is divided by L, the span, right? That's that's why you'll get an L squared over here, right? You're not this one more. So I'm just suggesting we, we agree on this so I, I don't have to look at plenty of different versions of the numerics, which would be tedious. I know you can't yeah. do that because I get irritable and that's the great
therefore, we might choose alpha to be some summation of n from 1 to 17. You probably don't need 17 terms. You probably get a really good answer, even with 1 term. <laughs> yeah, fantastic answer with 3 to 4. Right? And then you have some a sub n, alpha n of uh, 1. Okay? Where we're going to choose those things, choose those functions. And for the case at hand, what might we choose those functions to be? Well, we certainly want functions, even if we risk, so strictly speaking, we don't need to do this. We were ready with, if we had to be able to find some functions that satisfy all of the boundary conditions, that would be good. Strictly speaking, we only need to satisfy the geometric bound condition at the root, right? Which is alpha equals zero. So we want all these functions to be zero at alpha. With y is zero. We also want the total solution to be such that the alpha dy times gj, of course, is just that y equals l. Okay. In really rich, we don't really need to impose that kind of condition because really rich will take care of it if I use using that function theory. But what usually happens is if I have functions that satisfy all kind of conditions, the series converges more naturally as with how satisfying that boundary condition explicitly with each of these? And I only add them together to do it collectively, then I might need three or four. If I make sure these functions satisfy the boundary condition, all the boundary conditions, because they may only need one or two. Sometimes I didn't satisfy all the boundary conditions with these things that you can find. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. I'll just remind you of what those functions were. Alpha n was equal to two n minus one over two i over l. Those are the functions. If you if you zero at y equals zero, and the differentiation function you get cosine. And the cosines will be cosine pi over two, cosine three pi over two, cosine plus two. They'll all be zero. Okay. So we'll save that as a possible homework problem. Right? There's not that covered in the course or in the homework, just covered on the final thing, right? Mm -hmm. You heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what are we talking about? Gj, alpha dy, 
And now on GJ, I'm going to put a W. That stands for way. Okay. And then I can write one half, zero to zero to L, and GJ, C, that stands for control surface. That's the, that's the GJ of the control surface. Then D delta, <coughs> so delta may change with Y, right? It's the thing first is the control surface plus square D Y. And when I do this, and I apply the principle of virtual work, what is it, what is it in this expression that has, um, that has, uh, a virtual chain? So if I, if I want to compute del u from here, one of the prop, one of the one of the variables inside this that can have a virtual change. And by the way, when I take a virtual change and I use del for that, I'll never, ever confuse that with this del, which is the control surface rotation, right? And I might even put a little subshape over here so I, I would avoid that confusion. So what is, what are the, what are the things in here that vary that have a virtual change? They are? Yeah, well, it's alpha and delta. Now, it's this delta, right? Both of them can. Well, because they both can change, right, due to the deformation of the. Here's another little concern. Let's go back here. Let's go draw our picture. Here's our wing. Here's our control surface. The input, so this one has delta of y. This one has alpha of the implication of drawing this line is that the control surface is connected to the wing. In fact, most control surfaces are. But the last time you flew an airplane, you can look how they're, they're connected. It's pretty complicated, right? Yeah. And, and modeling that is not trivial. You usually have to really dig into the blueprints of the computer rendering of the configurations and know how those connections are made. The simplest thing to do would be to assume they're connected along this line, right? That would mean that this delta, which depends on y, uh, uh, is related to how this is connected in this fashion, right? Um, for example, if I, if I had a uh, connection that was, let's say, a spring at a couple of points, so I'm going to draw this down like this, but not too far. If I have a spring, Say a torsional spring. I'll call it K. I'll call it K alpha delta to indicate the spring connects the wing to the control surface. Right? Then I would have another term in U. U is equal to U is equal to what I've had before plus K alpha delta times alpha of Y wherever the spring is connected, minus delta of y squared, right? At y equals points of connection. We still uh -huh. Now, you can go through this and arrive at a difference of place for alpha. And a different equation for delta. An attempt to solve them, I would recommend that. You could try. Or, or we can simply use two different series, one for alpha and one for delta. We can have alpha of y equals summation over n, x of n, alpha n y. And then we have delta of y. I'll call it b sub m. Of him. And delta m of y. If both delta and, and alpha have the same bound conditions, we can use the same function, right? On the other hand, if they, this thing is to rotate, <laughs> the delta functions can't be zero here. Otherwise, they won't rotate, right? 
So we probably have to use some, a different set of functions than delta that we use for output. We can assume that the thing is fixed so that there's no output, no twist alpha at like the zero, but you can have a control service to And then of course, maybe this control service doesn't go to the complete span. Maybe there's a control service out here and then there's a gap. We have lots of time. But in principle, we can do this. But I'm not I should do that but I can't. All right. I think that's all I want to tell you about. Well, maybe one other thing. One other thing. It's about the more complicated case. Um, you could imagine. What is something that's not in there in terms of a case where. Uh, I mean, you can see when four is in the, the main chat room and in chat room. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's called. It's also a place that they want us to put the... They have a lot of people that call it tab, which is yet another control center. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that complicates things in terms of the bookkeeping, but the same method... Yeah, yeah it's good. So here's our way... But I should say it is. Maybe you want to call it now the main control service. Yeah. 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 So, same, same ideas, same methods can be used. Now we can use that one. Okay. Question. Let me pause here. Yes. Yeah. Are we just are we like Well, this this thing with analysis could also be used to do a do divergence calculation as well as a vertical calculation. Because once we allow the once we allow the and this is now the term of the problem. That will change the divergence condition. As you can imagine, if I have some finite elasticity to the point of I'll probably drive the divergence dynamic pressure down because this is a more elastic structure than it was before, right? Before, when we did divergence, we said like the control service was rigid and really didn't participate. But now, with this all being interconnected, yeah, you know, the divergence condition takes to. So, so those of us that make it over there, divergence, okay. as well as reversal. Oh, yes, okay. Okay, so what? They change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when the control service is elastic, or we model the control service as elastic. You can't do anything. No, I can't do that. I'm going to make you say No, you might say, well, how do I know? <laughs> we, we've changed by different models, right? We had that, that simple spring model, now we've got a wing model, now we have a wing plus a model. How do I know which model to use? Well, usually my, if I'm going to avoid my boss, <laughs> who's someone who's been doing this a little longer than I have, right? Um, but someday you may be the boss. If you're the boss, you have to decide. And it depends on where I am in the process. If I'm, if this is still a paper design, and, uh, you know, I'm still quite uncertain about how this, everybody's going to play. Look, I, I don't want to do an elaborate analysis, right? I would do something simple that gives me a ballpark answer. And then as the, as the time moves forward, then I'll say, well, maybe last time you did something, you told me the diversion Q is going to be somewhere between the 1 and 2 PSI. Well, I need to go on. An answer better than that. Well, okay, I can do a better analysis. I can give you an answer that's a little closer in terms of the range of possibility. Or more likely, what, what, what someone wants to design airplanes. I want you to tell me that no matter what happens when you do a more refined analysis, the divergence dynamic threshold will never be less than a certain amount. 
because I planned to fly the airplane up to that queue. And I'm, I'm just more, absolutely sure that I'm going to be less than that. Now, of course, when you do that, and I get later in the design process, the airplane I've designed is too stiff and therefore too happy, and I can't <laughs> live with that. So now I need a closer answer and a better model, because I'm going to cut the margin from what they were discussing. Okay. We are almost ready now to turn to dynamics. Are you ready to move on to dynamics? Okay, good. I'm happy for you. Let's uh, now talk about dynamics. Let me give you a preview of coming attractions. First one is to start reading. Okay. Uh, so, it's uh, the, the camera. We start talking about dynamics. And let me ask you the Revolving question. How many people know about Lagrange's equations? Uh, very good. Uh, sir? I want to make sure you're not hiding. <laughs> How many people know about Hamilton's principle? Um, uh, really good group. Uh, Stockholm, are all of you familiar with and, and, and love? Lagrange's equations and Hamilton's principle? Okay. Usually what happens is that uh, people uh, have oh, no. Okay. So let's uh <coughs> Well, uh, I usually, uh, I do have a fact that I'm going to do it just in the book. In the book, we, there are three great principles to dynamics. There's basically, the first was Newton's laws, right? Most people in their last time they don't use it. Because the Lagrange yeah. equation formulation and Hamlet's principle are so much more powerful. It's actually easier to use once you Oh, sorry. Thank you. Now, 
You can start just with any one of these and get to the other two and, and, and then practice. I mean, having said that, the easiest thing to do, the one I do with my book, I was just sure. I start with Newton's Law, and then I have the Chamber of Mental, and then the one I'm going to do. Fine. We're back in chapter three. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to What I'll do is, there's a strength to understand the Bible's version. So let me remind you of what Lagrange is going to do. It's E to C, L to Q, I, dot. This Q is never, ever to be confused with dynamic search. This Q is the generalized coordinate, right? Marshall L with respect to Q equals the function of I, where I is 1, 2, 3, as many as I need. It's the number of generalized coordinates I need to describe the system. If I have that wing with that um, expression for U, for potential energy, then uh, in principle there are enough of the number of these magnitudes, right? Because the number of things on it is in terms of the number of modes, there are different number of functions in my series and I use really good. Of course, in terms of I always stop at 17. Or right? So if I stop at 17, there will be 17 of these points. Dynamic energy. See, now we're doing dynamics, so we've got dynamic energy. Minus okay. where T is a kinetic energy. And in, in the case of my, my simple wing model, it has tor torsion in it. The kinetic energy will be a lower inertia associated with rotation times alpha dot squared, right? And so I have to write something down to represent kinetic energy. <coughs> okay. So, let's start from this and, and deduce. Yeah, let's go. Is that the I do. I do. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take one. And multiply by JR of QI. This is the virtual change in the generalized coordinates. And then we're going to then we're going to integrate for time T1, some chosen time, to T2, some later chosen time. You actually integrate backwards in time, but we we'll seem to do that for the moment. Okay. And then we're going to do some manipulations magically. Okay, one more time. Logical will appear at Hamlin's principle. So I'm going to, I'm going to write down Hamlin's principle and then you can check me to see if I get my answer. Okay. Hamlin's principle will be the following. Then we'll go from T1 to T2. DT. Okay. The right hand side is going to be zero because none of these manipulations are going to change the right hand side. The right hand side is zero from Lagrange's equation. And when I multiply del Q, I is still zero. And when I hear red from T1 to T2, it's still there. Right? So we're just playing with the left hand side. And it will turn out that this will be the following. It will be del of L plus del of W. That's the bridge of work. DT equals zero. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. 
Who is? Who is? Okay, we're over. So check me on this. Make sure this is. Okay. So now uh, let's let's do that. We've got uh, DDT, a partial L inspected Q dot. I'm going to leave off the, uh, the the I because I'm, I'm basically I'm just going to sum over all the I, right? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll well I'll put it down. I'll put it this just for this. Um, and now I'm going to put uh, QI on the left-hand side, this equal to zero, but then I'm going to multiply by del QI, then I'm going to integrate this back to T, T1 to T2. So all I've done is I've taken Lagrange's equation, put the capital Q on the left-hand side with the minus sign, and then multiply by del QI. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to leave this term alone because capital Q sub i multiplied by small del Q sub i, del small Q sub i. I'm going to find that in virtual work. Okay. We, so, I'm, I'm going to find, I'm going to call, oh, and also we're summing it first. Summing over all i. I'm going to talk about the virtual work and talk about the sum over i of capital Q sub i, del Q sub i. Okay? That's the, the definition of virtual work. That's formulation. Okay? Note already, this is a minus of virtual Yes. Is the sign that this one will come down to the del i minus the capital uh, it, it, yeah, it's going to be minus delta, right? Yeah. But then, uh, so up here it's going to be plus, right? <laughs> it won't worry if it's a zero. If all the terms have minus signs, this together is going to turn out to be minus del L. <laughs> so it's, it'll all work out. Okay. I mean, I, I could I could now change all the signs if you want me to. You want me to do that? No, no, no. No, it's not necessary. Yeah. But it, as I illustrated earlier this morning, discussing homework that I'm doing, important to keep track of this one. I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave this, this term alone because, in some sense, it's a perfect differential, right? But then this term, uh, I'm going to I'm going to integrate by parts. Normally, what you do is you start with this and integrate by parts the other way, and lead, that leads you to the Lagrange equation. This time, I'm going to integrate by parts and go back. Go back to the line. So this term, and I'm going to leave off the summation, and I'll leave off the i because that just gets carried along, right? <coughs> All right. Then um, I've got a term like DDT, partial L with respect to QI dot del QI. Well, I said I'm going to leave off the i. I, I will. Well, no, I'll do it. Wait a <coughs> But I'll leave out the sum. So I'm going to integrate that by parts. Okay. If I get integrate by parts, I'm going to get partial of L respect to QI dot del QI integrated from T1 to T2 minus, here's, here's where all my terms get, minus, minus um, partial of L integral from T1 to T2. Partial of L. Let me see, I'll see it. Partial of L with respect now to Q dot times del of Q I dot. Mm -hmm. What what point is it should give you? I have assumed that the virtual operator and the rigid time are interchangeable. Because we're of course in mathematics, so it's a calculus of variation. Uh, 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 u
That's why I can treat each I term independently. I'm going to assume they're arbitrary and independent, but they are, these virtual changes in the generalized coordinates are not allowed to vary at two instants of time of interest to me in this dynamic situation. There's a general theory which actually includes that term and you can use the same, but that's the standard I think. Okay, so with all that, what have I got? I've got the integral from T1 to T2. Now I'll put the summation back in I. Uh, minus DL DQI dot times del QI dot minus DL DQI times del QI minus Q sub capital Q sub I times del QI equals zero. And what is this thing? If I believe in the chain rule of differentiation, if I can express the Lagrangian, which is, remember, the Lagrangian is really kinetic and minus potential energy. If I can express T, the kinetic energy and the potential energy, is solely as functions of QI and QI dot, and therefore L only depends on QI and QI dot, then the two terms together are del L. The virtual change in, in the Lagrangian with the minus sign, of course. Now, if you if you will, I'll, I'll, I'll multiply all the minus signs <laughs> by minus one to make the plus. Is that okay? Yeah, no point that. Del L is partial of L respect to QI dot times del QI dot plus partial of L with respect to QI. So now I can write, this is really just del L, taking care of the minus signs, plus del W, dt equals zero, and that's Hamlin expensive. I have to confess, I have not read Hamlin's original paper, so I don't know if this is what he's right or not. Remember, he knew, he knew Lagrange's equation. He also didn't do the second one. So he could have gone either way. You can also, as described, I don't start with do the second law and derive Hamlin's principle from that. And then I derive Hamlin's principle from that. And Hamlin did it. He, he knew do the second law. <laughs> he knew the first equation. In which way he did it, I have no idea. <laughs> It, but you can start with any one and get to the other two. Now, why do we have Hamlin's principle when we have Lagrange's equation, which is a perfectly good thing to have, right? Well, remember, in Lagrange's equations, these Q sub i are only a bit of time, right? So if I have a system where it would be my time, this angle depends on the flag and also why. So, you need delta L? I really can't. I don't know. 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 I The only way I can use the Gaussian equations is if I also invoke Rayleigh Rent. Because then I've got to write this, I'll write it in this notation. Q sub n, that's the generalized coordinate, right? Which depends on time, and some alpha n's, it depends on y. So if I do this, right, and then I evaluate L, and the virtual work, Sure enough, I can use the Lagrange equation. But if I wanted to, for some reason, I wanted to know the, the differential equation of motion, which I might. Maybe that would be fascinating for some reason. But Hamlin's principle is the way to do that. Also, a Hamlin's principle, remember, has no additional charge. It gives you the right boundary condition. And even if you decide to use Lagrange's equation and use some 
bone shapes. You might want to use a Hamlet special to tell you what the boundary conditions should be, and therefore make sure you're using the right bone shapes when you use Michelangelo's equipment. So there's several reasons why Hamlet's special might be a good thing. Okay. Is it just some high attention? I know you have an internal answer. I think you can name instead of a right one. Any questions about any of this? Here in Durham, and also when it's up on. Can you do the N-D? That's not for me. Okay, I can't. Uh, can I like this? Okay. I think this is an item. You've got a homework assignment? Yeah. Uh, golly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.